Good morning. Before we settle down into our worship, we will begin as we begin many of our Sundays with something called loved, living our values every day, where we hear from one of our many groups that are living out the values of USNH uh, day by day, week by week. This morning, we welcome members of the Budget Planning Task Force up here for our loved message. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Laura Patey, and I'm here representing the Budget um, Planning Task Force. The December worship theme is wonder, which is particularly relevant to the Budget Planning Task Force message to you today. Like so many other Unitarian Universalist churches, and if we're honest, most other institutions that have formed the architecture of our lives, we are together facing unprecedented challenges as the pandemic subsides. Many of these challenges predate the pandemic, but are now being looked at in the stark light of day in a changed world. One constant throughout is the strong, arguably growing need for community and close connections. Always a key element at USNH. Although we might want to go back to the world as it was, there is only the future ahead of us, and change is always with us. Whether we like it or not, money is a pivotal piece of our work ahead. In May, the, bar, the board charged the management team and finance committee with creating a task force to develop a sustainable budget, hence the budget planning task force. I ask that the members of the task force who are here today please stand. You can reach us, thank you. You can reach us by emailing budget at usnh.org. The question before us is this. How is USNH going to evolve to meet the needs of our members and of the wider community we serve? The task force has launched an initiative to reimagine and revitalize our USNH community post-pandemic. We ask you, each and every one of you, to engage with us in a focus group about what we need and receive from USNH, to share your dreams for this faith community, and to brainstorm about practical and imaginative ideas to address our challenges. Friends, let me be blunt. We face serious financial challenges, and we must find ways to close the gap between our operating expenses and our revenue. We've been here before, in 2009, we faced similar financial difficulties, and we were able to find a solution. We're very hopeful for new and creative opportunities. Let's think outside the box and be willing to experiment to build the USNH community we want for the future. From that vision, we will build a sustainable budget. Join us for a focus group and be part of the process. We'll be running groups at various times, both in person and over Zoom. We'll be reaching out to folks, but we'll also have sign-up sheets in the social hall after the service today. There are several groups scheduled before the Christmas holidays, and we invite you to participate. We look forward to listening to you. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Jim Peters. My pronouns are he and him. I'm a member of the worship committee, and I'm happy indeed to welcome one and all to this in-person and online service of the Unitarian Society of New Haven. Whether you're participating in person or joining us via the live stream, please know you are welcome here. In this space, we are participating in the ongoing work of building beloved community, where we are all welcomed with our questions and our certitudes, our wholeness and our brokenness, our humor and our deep seriousness. We try to hold it all in a spirit of open-hearted speaking and listening, of trying to be fully present for each other in all the ways in which we are able, and what could be more wonderful than that? Uh, this morning, I'd like especially to thank those many people who are helping to make this service work today, the USNH Folk Group, and Jesse Greist, and Lisa Anderson, Bill Braun, uh, Paul Trotta, and Larry Copes, back there on the, uh, and, and one more, Carol, thank you. Anyway, so it takes many people to make this service happen, and grateful for all. As you may have read online, our minister, Reverend Linda Susan Ulrich, is taking a family leave of absence. Please know the staff and lay members of USNH are working together to provide worship leadership and pastoral support during Reverend Linda Susan's absence. If you're visiting us for the first time, or perhaps new enough to USNH that you have questions about Unitarian Universalism in our congregation, please grab a cup of coffee or tea in the social hall and join us today in room 209, upstairs on the left, for our monthly visitors chat right after the service, sponsored by the Connections team. Columbus House dinners are back. USNH is partnering with a group of synagogues to fund the cost of Christmas dinner. We need 30 households to donate $25 each to meet our goal. Checks can be made out to USNH with CH Dinner on the memo line. Also, we hope to restart our fourth Friday dinners at Columbus House in January. We need a strong team to support this. Please email H-E-A-R-T at usnh.org if you're interested or want more information. Next Sunday, December 11th, the fall congregational meeting will take place here in the sanctuary at noon following the service. It will be a hybrid meeting. People can participate remotely using the same Zoom as for the morning service. Please come if you can, as we do the important work of our community in community. You can find more information about the meeting in the weekly online newsletter. And I'll just put in a plug for that newsletter. It has a lot more announcements than anyone can give at the podium, and it's really important reading. The last announcement I'd like to make, oh, two more. One is that the regifting uh, is going to continue after the service. If you haven't had a chance to go take a look at the wonderful opportunities there in the social hall, please do so. And um, Sharon McBlain would like, us, would like you to know that uh, they're collecting funds for Christmas gifts for the Waverly Kids again this year. So if you'd like to participate and you're online, you, just, just, you can leave, write a check with Waverly in the memo line and send it in, or you can see Sharon in the social hall after the service. She'll be over to the side, and uh, thank you for that. And now as I invite Jesse up to share the call to worship, I invite one and all to silence their electronic devices as we gather together. Welcome once again. My name is Jesse Greist, and I'm the director of Lifespan Religious Education. Our call to worship this morning comes from the Reverend Scott Taylor. Look, my friends, to the sky to the stars that dance like fireworks overhead, this tiny globe on which we travel. Look to the horizon, the tree line, the expanse of wide open fields, to this living, breathing earth that makes our living and breathing possible. Look at the faces that surround you. In fact, take a moment, look at the faces that surround you. And notice what a wonder it is that we don't have to walk this world alone. 
All of it is a miracle. All of it deserves our awe. Let us now worship together. And as Jim lights our chalice, we share the words of Reverend Dr. David Breeden. We light this flame, reminding ourselves to treasure the magic in the mundane, the wonders of carbon dioxide, of oxygen, nitrogen, rapid oxidation, into light, heat, the dance of a flame. We light this chalice, kindling, remembering, our innate sense of wonder at the very real magic of our world. Friends, covenant lies at the center of how Unitarian Universalists gather in community. We're united not by a particular set of beliefs, but by the promises we make about how we'll be together, how we'll treat each other, and how we'll seek to mend relationships when we fall short of our aspirations. For quite a while, we recited our co covenant in a way that gives an overview of everything we promise one another. More recently, though, we focused on one element in its entirety. Today, we'll speak about our promise to value differences. Please join me in reciting the words that appear in your order of service or in the chat on the live stream. We covenant together to create and nurture a culture of kind and kindness and to engage in the spiritual and everyday practice of loving more generously. To this end, we will strive in part to value differences by welcoming diversity in all its forms, celebrating the unique qualities and gifts of every individual, and by honoring the diversity of our spiritual paths. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Christopher Grundy. I'm the director of music here at USNH. I invite all of you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing number 1001 in the Teal Hymnal, Breaths. <laughs>
ever since there have been humans. There has been curiosity and wonder on one hand, and stories to explain and to give words to our curiosity and wonder on the other hand. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, that we right now are in the Indus River Valley 3,500 years ago. We are around a fire, and we are wondering at the disappearance of the sun, at the disappearance of the moon, seemingly by magic. We begin to tell a story to explain the strange disappearance of the sun and the moon at random intervals, seemingly random intervals. We tell a story about beings that are essentially positive and beings that are essentially negative, the suras and the apsuras and how they have striven throughout their history for immortality. They have finally found in the depths of the ocean a substance called Amrit that allows them to become immortal, and the suras have gathered around in a circle. Among the suras are some characters who you might, rem who you might recognize. These characters include Surya, who we call the sun, Chandra, who we call the moon, Rahu, who we, who we might refer to as a mischievous demon or devil. Rahu has snuck into this circle of suras. He was not invited. He didn't receive an invitation. But he wanted to taste the Amrit and gain immortality as well. And so, as the cup of Amrit was passed around from person, from uh, Sura to Sura, and they bring it up to their lips to become immortal, Chandra whispers to Surya, the sun, and says, That's Rahu. That rascal has made his way into our midst. And so, the spirit of Vishnu, as Mohini, takes out his discus, and throws it across the circle. The next thing we know, Rahu is just a head. Immortal, because just before the discus made contact with him, he got a little bit of Amrit on his lips. And so his head becomes immortal while his body falls away. He is so angry so angry at this that he decides to live out the rest of his immortality ever chasing down the sun, ever chasing down the moon, and when he catches up with them, he opens up his mouth and swallows them. But being only ahead, a few minutes later, they come boop, out the other side, out his neck. This story told 3,500 years ago was written down in scriptures that we now know as the Vedas. This story has now received a, a rounding of science and we know that it is a game of shadows. And we call this dance of Rahu and Surya and Chandra eclipses. But let's take another moment, my friends. Let us think about the mysteries and wonder that we have now, in 2022. Think about the stories that we tell about whether or not there might be life beyond our galaxy. Think about the stories that we tell about mysteries of aging, the mysteries of ailments, things that, 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 that happen to our bodies. And let us now take one more leap in our imagination. And let us wonder for a moment. Let us hope that someday in the future, we will look back and some of today's mysteries, things like 
war, things like racism, things like hatred between people, words like cancer, these might someday be myths that we tell around a fire of times of old. And with that, Christopher is going to help us sing our children out to their classes. So would all children please rise with me and head out to your classes as Christopher sings us out. I'll ask you all to join me again with the words that are printed on your page, where you go. And we learned this with Reverend Linda Susan a couple of weeks ago. So those who you remember, please join in. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. For your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people, your divine, my divine. We've come to the moment in our service where we hold up the collective joys and sorrows of this community. Some joys are made to be shouted to the mountaintops and some sorrows are lightened when they are shared within this community of care. Elaine Culp shares the joy that yesterday, December 3rd, was recognized at the United Nations as a, the International Day for Disabled Persons. Ellen Greist shares that her beloved cat companion, Jake, was attacked last week. He's okay, but he has been recovering in Central Veterinary Hospital since last Friday. Frank Jonitz continues to recuperate in a rehab facility in New Haven after a tough November spent in both St. Rayfield's and Yale New Haven hospitals. He welcomes calls and visits. Please contact the office or Jesse Greist for details. For these and all the burdens and delights of our hearts, spoken and silent, we hold this moment with love and compassion. Our meditation this morning is written, was written by uh, the late John Marsh, beloved member, a uh, uh, beloved former uh, interim minister at this congregation. And it's called With or Without Candlelight. If you're going to meditate by candlelight, do not hurry to light the candle. The glow may concentrate your energies, but it will cost you the contours of the room. If you walk the night forest by flashlight. The electric beam may reveal details on your path, but you will lose everything beyond your concentrated ray. All that your light does not expose will become alien. The sounds of animals will frighten you. Shut off the beam and you will travel the night forest as one who belongs. Let us praise things dark and beautiful, the quiet of closed eyelids, the childhood of chocolate, the respectability of newsprint, the suddenness of a bat's wing, the invitation of brewing coffee, the persistence of tar, the gentleness of nutmeg, the temptation of a cave. If you are going to meditate by candlelight, do not hurry to light the candle.
In this season of shortened days and longer nights of holiday cheer and fellowship, let us remember that the work of this congregation requires the support of each of us as we are able. I urge you, if you are participating this online this morning, to navigate to the USNH website and click on the donate button on the homepage. Pledge or plate donations can be made by check and sent here to 700 Hartford Turnpike, Hamden, Connecticut, 06517. Ushers will be present at the back of the sanctuary at the end of the service to receive donations. In whatever ways you contribute to the life of this community, please know that your generosity is sincerely appreciated. Mysteries, yes, by Mary Oliver. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs. 
how rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity. While we ourselves dream of rising, how two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. <laughs> Let me keep company always with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Friends, this morning I would like to explore together the human capacity to experience wonder. I will share some wonderful experiences that have held special meaning in my life. And at the end, I will invite us all, both here and those joining us online, to focus each of us on some moment where a sense of wonder captured our imagination. More on that later. But first, let's, let's be honest. We're living in times that can trouble even the most optimistic among us. No one has to be convinced of this, I think, but this morning, while fully acknowledging the stressful and complicated world we live in, I'd like to challenge us to live in the both and. Things can be both broken and not wholly so. Our lives are never just one thing or going just one way. In the deepest gloom, there can be glimmers of hope. I say this because I aim this morning to lean rather unapologetically into an appreciation of wonder. I wonder in truth what would be if we all embraced wonder as readily as we accept the often brutal facts of life. I wonder what we might unlock within ourselves if we tried at least now and then to embrace mystery and illogic and whimsy and awe. It might not solve the world's woes, but maybe wonder can make us a little stronger and more resilient agents of change and transformation. A little wondering goes a long way, I think. I went online for a definition of wonder, and this came up. Noun, a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. Google's, Google is a wonder. <laughs> of, of course, right below that was the verb phrase, to wonder about, which means something quite different, as in, I wonder about Jim, he thinks dad jokes and puns are amusing. <laughs> but let's keep things simple and start with a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. I see that. We often wonder at something. There's some cause, and the inner experience of wonder is the effect. That certainly resonates within me. I've had an amazing week, actually, thinking about experiences in my life where I was surprised by something wondrous. It's a remarkably uplifting experience, really, to remember oneself by this means, to do a personal history through the lens of wonderful moments. We all have our inventory. Here's part of mine organized by which of my senses were uppermost in the experience. When I think of wonder elicited by seeing something, the other day in the backyard, sunlight and broken clouds combined to create a Jacob's Ladder effect with rays of light streaming down towards the earth. In the same backyard, watching a goldfinch swoop onto one of the thistle feeders in my backyard elicits that feeling. Once, oh, once while I was falling asleep in a Zimbabwean national park named Manapools back in the 1980s, I heard and then saw an elephant's trunk poke through an opening in the large canvas tent where I was. Just the trunk in outline. 
sounds can also trigger wonder. I think of the sound of loons trilling to each other in an otherwise quiet summer night on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. The sound of train whistles from the tracks just to our east here, early in the morning, like roosters heralding the dawn. Reflecting on a sense of smell, there's a scent I remember from childhood, walking out of my house just after a thunderstorm, that smell of ozone in the air as a storm blew through, or the mixed aromas of a modern pizza Italian bomb right out of the oven, wonder on a platter. And, and taste, I remember in my 20s, driving near Greenfield, Massachusetts and stopping because some kids were selling wild strawberries by the side of the road. I have never before or since tasted anything remotely like them. They were like strawberries just turned up to an 11. They, they blew me away and I can still see the paper bag they came in and touch. When I was 30 and a new father, I remember the feeling of my infant daughter's impossibly tiny fingers wrapping around my thumb and squeezing. These are all examples of what I mean by being surprised into a state of wonder. They came unexpectedly and pulled me out of wherever my thoughts were and into a state of intense in-the-momentness. It's like for a charged instant of sensory awareness, everything else fades while I'm in thrall. And all those kinds of experiences have a way of hanging around, of finding their way into long-term memory. It's as though we are perhaps wired to make experiences of wonder sticky within our memories. That said, I think the idea of wonder can hold more than a reaction to some unexpected stimulus. On reflection, I've discerned other ways that wonder enters my life, ways that feel less like they arrive as a surprise. Several examples come to mind. One is that any aquarium, Mystic or Norwalk or anywhere, if they have a jellyfish tank, I'm drawn to it like, moth, uh, like a moth to a flame. I, I could watch jellyfish undulate in their rhythmic manner for an astonishingly long time. I know I'm going to be captivated, but it's no less wonderful for the advanced knowing. I stare in a state of what I believe is a kind of wonder until someone in my entourage, never me, says it's time to look at something else. Or as anyone in my family will confirm, I can't stop myself from watching airplanes as they pass overhead when I'm outdoors. My sister-in-law, when she married my brother 40 years ago, listed this as one of the Peters family's most bizarre traits. <laughs> it's not a short list. We'll, we're, we'll be grilling on the deck or playing badminton or whatever, but when a plane passes, we'll just stop and stare. Each time, it triggers a sense of wonder within me. Who's on the plane? Where's it going? Where did it come from? Can I go? Just before Easter, uh, the year before the pandemic, my wife and I spent a day at the Kuchenhof Gardens in Amsterdam, just outside of Amsterdam. These gardens are tended year round, but only open to the public for about 10 weeks, beginning at the end of March till about Easter. And they are a living testament to the ability of blooming flowers to inspire wonder. Walking through the indoor pavilions filled with every variety I could imagine, and outside gardens overflowing with tulips and daffodils and irises, I found the entire experience a prolonged experience of wonder. On a different trip, we went to the Normandy beaches and the American Cemetery just above Omaha Beach, and that elicited a different but no less powerful sense of awe and humility in the face of such unimaginable sacrifice. I imagined I would feel that way as we made our way there, but the actual experience was far more powerful. I think that Normandy on that November morning became a thin place for me. By that I mean it was a place where I felt closer to a transcendent reality that I often reflect on but less often feel in my bones. I felt wonder in my bones that day. I think our ability to experience wonder is powerfully enhanced in thin places. Another thin place for me is in Paris, specifically the Orangerie Museum, designed in consultation with the artist Claude Monet, eight of whose water lily paintings fill the walls of two large, indirectly sunlit oval viewing rooms. 
The canvases are of the lilies in the pond of Monet's home in Giverny. This isn't the place to review the history of Impressionist art or how Impressionists played with light in their paintings. What I can say is that sitting quietly in those two rooms, gazing at the canvases largely filling my field of vision, I found myself in a state of prolonged and profound wonder. The paintings become deeply three-dimensional for me, and the images seem to come alive, full of light and movement. I've been to the orangery, I think, half a dozen times, and each time the experience is different, but each time it's immersive and captivating and profoundly wondrous. In fact, I think that part, one of the hardest parts of being sequestered during the pandemic was being cut off from the experience of engaging art in person. I found not being able to visit any art museum for almost two years incredibly tough. I felt its absence acutely. It, there's something about the simple act of putting oneself in the midst of art fashioned by human hands and human imagination that engenders a sense of wonder I can't recreate on my own. Fortunately, while institutions were largely unavailable during the pandemic, the night sky remained open for business and birds kept migrating. Outdoors experiences that seemed increasingly safe over the pandemic months and kept my spirits higher and helped to keep the Wonder Reservoir filled. One recent example, some of you may have done this as well, is watching a full lunar eclipse uh, early in November last month. My wife Jean and I got up early and watched the eclipse reach, to reach totality. There's this period when the eclipse isn't complete yet. It's coming but not full, and that, that space, that almost space, is full of wonder for me. The anticipation builds the sense of wonder. The pace of the event is slow, but steady, almost hypnotic. I said I'd seen lunar eclipses twice. The first was in May 1985, when I was teaching in Zimbabwe, as I mentioned last week. It was in the early evening, and all the boarders were in study hall, maybe 300 or so. I called them all out of their classrooms into a courtyard where everyone could see the night sky. The moon was already partly in shadow, orange and ethereal. I asked for explanations as to what was going on. It took a while, but we finally got to the idea that the full moon wasn't as bright anymore because something was blocking the sunlight. What's blocking the sun, I asked. What's between the sun and the moon right now? Waiting, waiting, waiting. Then one voice, I'll never forget it, said, we are. We're in the way. It's the Earth in the way. There was this thick, collective sigh of acknowledgement. And just about then, the eclipse reached totality, and the moon shone dimly but distinctly above. There were, as I say, hundreds of us, and it was totally silent. Hundreds of high schoolers together are never totally <laughs> silent. Those minutes of prolonged stillness, that group experience of celestial geometry was as wonderful as anything I've ever experienced. So I think that wonder can take us by surprise, and I also think that we can put ourselves into situations where we activate our inner wonderers. We can know something wonderful is going to happen, and knowing it doesn't stop it. But I think there is a third way of experiencing wonder, one I'm calling seasons of wonder, times when I was shifted into a way of being in the world where wonder felt unusually and persistently present. Two such seasons were when my two children entered the world. The mix of exhaustion and anticipation and excitement and constant discovery created a space unlike any other in my life. Those were two extended seasons of life where wonder made a place in our home and just settled in for the duration. There was a feeling of being part of something beyond ourselves, against something transcendent and yet awfully earthly and matter of fact. The diapers tend to put thoughts of transcendence in healthy perspective. <laughs> but as sleep deprived as we were, I felt so energized and indeed full of wonder at what had just entered the world. The last illustration is more complex and it concerns a dear family friend. I met Doreen and her, fam her husband, Ron, in the 70s at a summer conference that we attended year after year. Half a generation older than my wife and me, they became like grandparents to our children. 
We spent two weeks a year at their home in the Laurentians in Quebec, Canada, one in August and one just after Christmas for decades. We spent over a year of our life with them. Ron and Doreen's lives were deeply woven into our own. Ron passed almost exactly seven years ago. Three years ago, before the pandemic, Doreen, who had a chronic blood disorder, took a turn for the worse. Canada has right to die laws, and following them carefully and with the consent of several doctors, Doreen decided that she was ready to depart this life. Jean and I visited her in the hospital the week before as the final steps of the approval process were made. There was no dissenting voice, and Doreen was crystal clear in her intention. In early August, we said our final goodbyes to Doreen in Canada. One week later, my wife and our children sat on a spit of land on Lake Winnipesaukee, surrounded by many friends as we marked the time of Doreen's passing. We knew the hour, if not the exact minute, and we held vigil. Between our goodbyes in Canada and that vigil on the lake, that was a week for me unlike any other. Time took on a special kind of meaning as we knew what people so often don't know, when our beloved friend's time on this earth would be over. There was an energy in those days that was absolutely filled with awe and deep emotion at Doreen's decision about the impending loss, but also this enormous sense of gratitude for her life. I've never felt so collected, connected to wonder for such an extended time. So the more I've thought about our capacity as humans to engage wonder, the larger, more wide open I have to make any box that tries to contain it. And I think that while it sounds, well, wonderful to be open this way, I think it takes real intention. I take John Marsh's meditative reading from earlier in the service as a reminder. It's tempting to keep the lights on, the more clearly to see, but mystery and wonder sometimes ask us to wander out of our comfort zone. And I think that's why I value Mary Oliver's writing so much, for if anyone could discover wonder all around her, on every walk in the woods, in any season, it was Mary Oliver. Wonder can make me feel small amidst the vastness of the cosmos, and yet that smallness doesn't, for me, translate to insignificant. Quite the opposite, I feel like something, I feel like some small part in a larger whole. I think a mind open to wonder also means opening to possibilities. When we begin a sentence with the words, I wonder, I wonder what, or who, or why, or when, when we start with wonder, we open up the possibility that we don't ourselves have all the answers, that we have to engage the world with at least some measure of humility and openness to the wonderings of others. I think of our covenant, and it's filled, I think, with commitments we make when we assume more than one right answer or more than one point of view. I think an embrace of wonder fits very well within our stated commitments to one another as Unitarian Universalists and as members of this congregation. Isaac Asimov famously said, we are made of star stuff, hoping, I think, to help us feel connected to the wide universe. I think we are also the sum of our wonderings, for in wondering we become open to many possibilities. For a week, I've been engaging my own practice of searching for experiences of wonder in my life's journey, and now I ask for your participation in that mindful work. I ask you to scour your own memory to find some time in your life where wonder took center stage. I'm going to hold just a few seconds of silence to just find that place. And now I ask, if you're willing, for your participation in a process of collective energy work, I ask that you hold that memory front and center in your thoughts and that you release it intentionally into the sanctuary space that we're inhabiting right now, whether you're sitting in a pew here or logging in remotely. Wherever you are, I invite you to energize this space with your wonderful memories. Let each expand to fill this blessed space. I'm going to put that elephant's trunk right up there. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be safe here. After all, there's a reason we call this place a sanctuary. And my hope is that this place and all who find comfort here can experience a portion of our collective wonderings. There can never be too much wonder. 
Friends, may we nurture always our ability to experience mystery amongst all the turmoil in our lives and the world around us. May we remain open to being surprised and delighted in unexpected moments, and may we feel always the enduring, wondrous joy of worship and fellowship in this beloved community. May it be so, and blessed be. My name's Sharon McBlain. I'm hoping you will all join me in singing page 95, There Is More Love Somewhere in the Gray Hymnal. Please stand and if you can, in body and spirit, join in. As David extinguishes the chalice, I invite you to join me in the words used uh, for extinguishing that you can find in your order of service. Together, let us say, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our benediction comes from the Reverend Joan Javier Duval. Here we are, living, breathing creatures with minds that wonder and hearts that feel awe. We face questions that we know can't be answered and tragedies we know can't be explained. May we find patience in all that is unanswered and peace in all that will never be explained. Here we are, living, breathing creatures with open minds and tender hearts. May we hold ourselves with gentleness with all that brings us worry and all that makes our hearts break. May the living, breathing creatures that we are feel the breath of life moving in us and through all things, bringing us into greater union with the mysterious universe of which we are a part. Blessed be. Amen.